Welcome to the Fundamentals of Carp Fishing. This is a new six part series which I'm doing in conjunction with JRC and Carpology. In this episode, we're going to be looking at carp rigs and their evolution and look at a couple of rigs that I use in my day to day fishing as well. When I think how much rigs have changed in the last, even in the last 10 years, it's astonishing. But when you think back to the sort of gear I was using when I was a, a mere nipper, it's almost like a different kind of fishing altogether. Carp rigs through the 80s um, and early 90s were all about suppleness, making the bait behave as naturally as possible. And really the hair rig itself was, was a, about that, that separation of the bait from the hook using super fine line so that the bait in theory behaved independently of the tackle and completely naturally. The problem with having really supple, flexible, fluid end tackle is of course that it causes tangles and they have been the number one enemy of the carp angler since, since forever really. Um, probably not going back as far as free line potatoes because they don't tend to tangle too much. But when I think of uh, a lot of the rigs that I used to use and, and my peers, we used to use rigs tied with things like Christon multi-strand which is most of you won't be familiar with, I wouldn't have thought unless you've been around gathering grey hairs as long as I have, but it's a, a multi-filamented, um, I was going to say braid, but it's not even braid. It is just a collection of, of strands of fibre that in the water dispersed to a certain point to make the bait completely behave naturally and fluid and be weightless as if it's attached to nothing. A great principle, great concept, we all caught fish on multi-strand, but again, that uh, inherent likeliness that you're going to have a tangle was always there, and a tangled rig is out of the game. It's, you're not going to catch anything on that. So as, as carp rigs evolved, they took two um, key directions, really. The first being that as far as possible, with good casting technique, good angling practice, tangles were mitigated to, to virtually zero. And that remains one of the most important cornerstones of modern carp fishing, ensuring that you're fishing at 100% efficiency all the time. And I can't overstate that enough. You know, if you, you imagine if, you've, if you're fishing a rod, um, a water that's got a two rod limit, then if one of your rods is tangled, you are 50% out of the game. You know, when you think of it in those brutal binary terms, it's, um, it doesn't bear thinking about it. It's, it's shocking, you know, to drop 50% of your capability through one bad cast, one tangled rig or a rig that's in weed is, uh, is unforgivable really because time's important. And um, when we're out there on the bank, having spent all the money that we do to get there on tickets and bait and everything else and a petrol to get there, most of us will be probably pushing our barrows down the road the way things are going. But we owe it to ourselves that once we get there in a fishing situation, we fish at maximum effectiveness. So the key evolutionary stages really were, as I said, mitigating those tangles through the introduction of principally anti-tangle tubing, which has become you know, a bedrock of, of most people's carp fishing technical approaches. Anti-tangle tubing into a tail rubber, onto a lead clip or through the back of an inline lead, which was how we used to do it, mostly inline lead setups with anti-tangle tubing. And as long as you adhered to the, the main rule that the tubing had to be longer than the hook link by two or three inches, then with good casting technique, you wouldn't get any tangles. The other thing that really was a, a kind of a co-development was, was imparting rigidity and stiffness into rigs. So as rigs evolved, two key things happened. One was that anglers realised that stiff rigs, to use that, that sort of umbrella collective, were very, very difficult for carp to deal with. People like Mike Kavanagh spearheaded that, that drive and thrust. You know, they, they really did catch a lot of fish. They were really problematic for the carp to deal with. And also when you bear in mind that people had been using soft, supple braids and multi-strand and things for decades, and then suddenly they're given a rigid boom. You know, it really did upset the apple cart and was a game changer in its own right. 
But the other reason that hook links became stiff and rigid wasn't just to hook more carp. Of course, the, um, the byproduct, or, or probably the, the co-intention, I should say, was that a stiffer, the stiffer the rig is, the less tangles you're going to have, which comes back to what we were saying, you know, the number one enemy of the carp angler is a tangled rig that's out of the game. So imparting this rigidity into the rig causes huge, huge problems for the carp and also mitigates tangles. And in conjunction with anti-tangle setups such as inline leads and anti-tangle tubing or lead clips with anti-tangle tubing, we start to arrive at the perfect ensemble of tackle, which is going to hook the carp efficiently and is not going to lie in a tangled heap on the bottom. So that is a key evolutionary trend, really, which has gone on through the late 80s all the way through the 90s and continues apace today. And that's not to say that supple braids and more subtle approaches don't have their place. They certainly do. And I think now there's even more of an argument for those things because the carp are so accustomed to dealing with things down the more afore aforementioned route and we'll, we'll look at that in a little while so we're going to look at a couple of the rigs that i use in my day-to-day -day fishing how to tie them very basic simple rigs that have served me really well down the years and also a range of terminal items which have been bought to the market by JRC and we're going to have a little look through some of those and pick out a few things that we like and tie some rigs with them. Some years ago JRC developed quite a considerable reputation in the realm of end tackle. They had a fantastic range of gear which um, sadly isn't about anymore today but while it was it accumulated quite a good following of anglers and had a great reputation for its hooks and its bits and pieces. Fast forward to the modern day JRC, they have now introduced a new range of end tackle building on that expertise that they had from before and introduced basically a tackle item to cover every feasible, imaginable part of carp fishing. So it's very important to point out, I have been messaged a, a lot about this. This range of products hasn't been designed by me. So I just want to clarify that. I haven't designed the hooks. I haven't designed any of the products at all. And um, what they have done is they've been designed and brought to market by a team of very, very good European anglers who have really got their eye on the bullwood product and they've done the whole job themselves. So I'm going to show you a lot of the items today and show you how I make some of the rigs out of it. But as I said, I haven't developed any of this, so it's good. It's a good opportunity for us to go through this sort of learning and familiarization stage together. And as usual, I can give you an honest appraisal of what's what and there'll be no hard sell involved. So we've got loads of different items from hook links through to obviously hooks themselves in several different patterns and then all of the myriad items that you would expect to make a complete and effective terminal range from tungsten sinkers to different types of bead and sleeves, shrink tube, hair stops, um, leaders, fluorocarbon hook link, which I have used a fair bit and is very, very nice indeed. So we're going to look at a few of these things and we'll look at how to incorporate them into one or two effective rigs. As I say, I've used down the years a lot in my own fishing, which will work very well for you, whether you're fishing somewhere like we are today, which is the Trad Lake down at the brilliant Suffolk Water Park, where probably the run of the mill is doubles chance of a 20 or whether you're doing more sort of stepped up big carp fishing on, on lakes which have lower stocks for bigger fish. These rigs will work on both of those places very well for you. They're focused around boily fishing, but as we go forward through this series, we will be looking at other styles of fishing, particularly particle fishing and boily fishing as an actual approach. Whereas today we've got rods out, but the focus isn't really on the fishing. It's on looking at these lovely new bits and pieces and some of the rigs that we can make using them. So the rig we're going to look at making now is what I've called the multi hinge. It's a rig that I put in carpology down the years and one that I've used a lot and caught a lot of good fish on. It's important that we don't confuse the name of a rig with something being super fandango. I've had people mention to me, um, in person and on social media that the hook holds they get on a multi-rig are brilliant or um, the fish find a multi-rig really hard to deal with and stuff like that. Guys, you're, like, you're living in fantasy land. 
A multi-rig is just a way of attaching a hook. It doesn't do anything particularly special. And that's not denigrating its brainchild, Mike Kavanagh, because he came up with a brilliant way of quick changing your hook. And it is an absolutely fantastic rig for doing that. But over and above that, all it does is presents a bait off the bottom, popped up, although you can use it as a bottom bait, which we'll touch on later. The facilitation of being able to change your hook in an instant really suits anglers like myself and many, many others who love to hand sharpen hooks. So if you donk a hook point, you catch a fish, hook point's gone, or if you do it during the normal angling process, it's literally seconds to change the hook. That's the really unique, key, special part of the rig, and that's why I use it. I don't use it because it gives me an incredible hook. It does, as any pop-up boilie rig should do. But there isn't anything really fandango and swervy about it in itself that makes it hook more carp. So I think we've just got to demystify it a little bit. It's just a very, very good, fast-change um, rig, which will present a bait popped up off the bottom. So I'm going to look at some of the items that I use to make this rig. So today we're going to tie this with, um, we've got a chod hook link, which we're going to use for the bit that is right next to the hook. And we're going to attach that with an Albright knot to a coated hook link. We've got other little things that are handy, like a, a stripper for the coated braid and some rings and silicons and stuff like that, which we're going to look at incorporating into the rig as we go. I'm going to be tying it with a size six chod hook. Now, I've done tutorials now for over 10 years, and I can tell you there's a lot of anglers out there who don't have the eyesight or the manual dexterity that a lot of us take for granted. In fact, I had two guys last week, and they really struggle with tying things in a nuanced way. And the great thing about these hooks is that they have hopefully you'll better see an absolutely enormous eye and you might remember the film the basketball diaries it reminds me a little bit of that but again it's a super sharp hook point and the really big eye is going to really assist a lot of anglers who struggle with that manual dexterity and eyesight and as you'll see when we make the rig for passing a doubled piece of uh, chod filament through the eye, it's going to make life a lot easier. So we're going to start off with a piece of 25 pound chod filament. I'm going to cut off six inches or so. Not important the length too much. We're not going to use a really big length, but we don't want to cut it so short that it's going to be fiddlesome to tie. So what we're going to do is make that into a loop and then about, well I say about, an inch or so from the end of the loop I'm going to fold it back on itself. Now we're creating a loop that's going to pass through the hook eye and lasso over the hook so this is going to be the method that we're attaching the hook to the rig but it's very very important to remember that the size of the loop dictates how high off the bottom your bait is going to be presented. So if we want to be presented three inches off the bottom, we tie a three inch loop and so on and so forth. I tend to prefer a bait that's quite low to the bottom with a lot of movement to it. So what I'm going to do is tie this with a loop that's just about big enough to go over my size six hook. So you can see that, that that's going to pass over there easily. So we determine the length that we want. Again, I'm going for a small loop that will just go over the hook. We've got the loop formed there. We've got the two tag ends here. What I'm going to do is fold that back on itself to create effectively an eye on the end of the loop. Next, we're going to take some coated braid. This is a nice stiff coated braid, 25 pound breaking strain. And what I'm going to do is use the line stripper to take that stiff coating off the end so I don't knacker my teeth. And strip off about four inches or so off the end of that there. So we've exposed the nice supple inner core beneath. And we're going to use that to join to the loop that we've got in the end of our stiff chod filament using an Albright knot. Let's just take that bit of coating off there. 
Okay. So you can see straight away, very, very nice contrast between soft, supple and flexible, and then a bridged into this rigid coating, which is what any good coated hook link should have, a nice contrast between the two materials, or between the material in its uncoated state and in its coated state. So what we're going to do is take the end of the stripped braid and pass it through the eye that we've made by folding back the tag ends on the stiff loop. And we're going to pull that all the way through until between our finger and thumb we're holding the joint where the soft inner core meets the stiff outer core and you'll feel that between your fingers. And then we're going to take that and pass it around the stiff loop section working away from our finger and thumb. You want about eight or nine turns on that. This is the Albright knot. And when you've gone up the line eight or nine turns, we're going to come back down over the top another three or four. It doesn't matter how many, but three minimum. And the key thing with the Albright, as you can see there, this has come up from underneath. We want to go through against the way it's come. So we're going to poke it back through there so they, they're both flowing the same way through the hole, through that eye. Give it a wet and we're going to ease that down. And the key is you want to ease it down without pulling too much of the supple through. So ideally you want a finished completed knot with five or ten mil between the end of the knot and the start of the coated section on the braid. So I'm going to get that tightened down nicely. There we go. Puller tools are very handy. So now you can see we've got a loop, nice stiff loop, two tag ends and a braid tag end. So we're going to trim all of those off now. Tidy the rig up. Get rid of these two tag ends, these prongs. And this is what we've got so far, guys. We have got a very, very stiff loop which junctures into 10 mil or so, a very, very soft, supple braid, which then obviously becomes coated braid with that nice rigidity which we need for anti-tangle purposes principally but also to boom the bait away from the lead which we'll get into in a bit. So what we need to do now is tidy this up and we can do that with shrink tube or we can do it with silicon tube. So we've cut a piece of shrink tube and placed that over the knot just to make everything nice and neat and streamlined. That slid over the knot, that join there between the materials and steam down over a kettle. And we now ha have a very, very neat stiff loop which is joined to our coated braid using that Albright knot. And the next thing we're going to do, and again, this is where these very big eyes on the hook really come into their own, is squeeze that down to a point and pass it through the hook eye. So we're going to pass it through the hook eye from the point side so the exit's on the back and then we're going to get a nice big ring which my ex had, pass it over the end of the stiff loop and then we're going to pass the stiff loop over the top of that chod hook. Now once we've got to this stage I'm just going to in insert something with a bit of diameter to it, it's just this old fashioned needle that's got a nice chamfer to it and I'm going to put that through the D, come here, and then pull down with my hand on that hook link to get a nice shape to that D. You can do that with any kind of uh, rig tool really that's got a bit of a diameter to it. But what you're trying to achieve, you can see quite clearly here, is you hook about 45 degrees or so to the, the main stiff section and a nice well-formed D section on which that ring will travel nice and easily. And you'll see that those two tram lines of chod filament are a little bit wide apart, which makes that ring a little bit stiff to travel on. So just push those together like so. 
and then you'll get nice supple fluid movement of that ring which you want for the travel of the, the of the bait you can see you get a really really nice sentry straight pop-up rig there which although i said the multi-rig itself doesn't engender brilliant hook holds it just well, it does engender brilliant hook holds but not because it's a multi-rig it's just a, a rig that holds a, a nice big sharp hook up off the bottom attached to a boilie that's what gives you the good hook hold but because we have this loop we can take this hook as you'll see off and on in seconds just by passing the loop off the hook sliding the rig and the hook off and there you go ready to put on a new one should we need to so i'm just going to pass that back on there which again takes seconds because it flies through that massive eye and pass the rig ring on and then just throw the loop back over the hook like so pull it down so that uh, the top of the the loop is about level with the barb it's not massively important and pull that down give that a bit of shape to it again like so okay so that's the business end of our multi hinge one of the last things that remains to be done is to slide a tungsten sinker onto this stiff coated braid we're going to slide it right down to where the stiff and supple meet and that's going to become an anchor point for us to mold our putty counterbalance which of course we need to counterbalance and pop up our boily hook bait so what we're going to do now is thread one of these lovely little tungsten sinkers onto the end of the hook link so we pass it through the wire eye and thread that on there like that and then this guy gets pushed all the way down that coated hook link to sit right on the juncture between the supple and the stiff and again that's going to be the anchor point for our tungsten putty which we're going to get next very very dense malleable pliable putty which is great i'm going to mold a, a piece of that the amount we're going to actually need for the finished job is undetermined as yet because we haven't put a bait on it but we want to see what the rig's going to look like so i can show you guys so we get that putty nice and soft and pliable between finger and thumb and then flatten it out and place the tungsten sinker in the center of it and then fold it round and give it a couple of twists to make sure that it's nice and sealed and streamlined and neat neatness is a factor particularly when it comes to rigs you know that neatness and attention to detail in all your carp fishing is very very important but when it comes to rigs it's imperative i always say to my clients that if you're going to make a rig you should make it with the same attention to detail and care that the finished article could be placed in a frame in a museum as the perfect example of that particular rig so always bear that in mind when you are constructing something you don't want it to be sloppy untidy unshapen or imperfect in any way it wants to look like a thing of beauty so i think you'll agree if i just stick this needle through here i think you'll agree that that is pretty neat and tidy so we've got a lovely stiff boom section which again the multi-rig has got that capacity for the quick change of the hook but when you tie it with a chod filament loop like this that stiff section is very difficult for carp to deal with and rig evolution has largely been about taking very very stiff materials and imparting a degree of movement through use of a hinge and the famous stiff hinge rig is the first example that will come to mind that that really was a forerunner in taking something very very rigid and stiff but giving it lots of movement at the same time and that is a key part of many many successful cart rigs and you'll see here that look at that that really really stiff rigid section has got the capacity to move in any direction at all and that's the key taking something rigid and stiff but giving it lots of fluidity and movement 
So we're going to look at terminating this at the other end. Um, we're probably going to use this on something like a lead clip. So all I would do is put on an anti-tangle sleeve and tie a figure of eight loop, which I'll show you. And then that means that we can quickly attach it or detach it to our end tackle. So we're going to do that next. So the, uh, the morning mist has burnt off and it's suddenly gone up about 10 degrees. So at risk of burning my massive forehead, I've had to take my woolly hat off. Um, where were we with the rig? So we're pretty much done at the sharp end. What we're going to do now is take an anti-tangle sleeve. And we're going to thread that onto the end of the hook link. So what I've done is threaded that anti-tangle sleeve on there, as you can see. And behind that, I'm going to tie a figure of eight loop knot. Like so. Give that a tighten down. Now what we will have to do is give this rig a bit of a steam down to get it nice and straight, as you do with most stiff coated braids, which this certainly is. Now I'm going to get this anti-tangle sleeve and slide it back up so that you can see we've got just a nice neat little loop on the end there which will attach to the quick change facility on our leg clip setup and we're ready to steam that out and get it nice and straight. So while we're waiting for the kettle to come to the boil so we can steam this off, length is um, a very very important thing as my wife always tells me, it's very important to give some thought to the length of that boom section. If I'm fishing over a really really clean hard bit of lake bed then I do like to keep it quite short and I'll go down to five or six inches and again, conversely, if I'm fishing out in the lake over a softer bottom silt or anything like that, then I, I tend to favour a, a much longer boom of something like this, which is probably about 10 inches. So that's what I've tied it off to. So generally speaking, the harder and cleaner the lake bed, the shorter the boom, and the softer and uh, stodgier it is, the longer the boom. So we're just going to steam this out nice and straight. Again, it just comes back to what I said earlier, every rig you make should be a little work of art that you could put in a frame. So make sure everything you do is neat, compact, tidy, and tied to the best that you can. I'm just going to pass that through the steam there. Make sure there is no flame licking up around the edge of that kettle. You will be back to square one in a heartbeat. And when you take it out of the steam, keep it under pressure and tension and it will set for you. So there you go, we've got a nice stiff rigid boom, a counterbalance of putty, and that really, really tasty looking whirly gig, super stiff hooking mechanism at the sharp end with the hook kicked over at about 45 degrees. So we're gonna attach a pop-up boilie to that, and then that's gonna be ready to cast out in the lake. So we're going to take a piece of floss and what I do is throw an overhand loop in it like so and then throw another loop, a smaller loop, on top of that larger loop. So you've got two loops like that. Take this tag end and pass it through both loops twice like that and then let go of the small loop, but keep hold of the big loop and pull both tag ends. And what you will have created is a sliding slip knot. We're going to take a boilie. And you're going to place that inside the loop of floss that you've just made. And then pull the loop down around the bait so that it is sitting centrally within that lasso of floss. Just manoeuvre it around a bit until it's where you want it and then pull it down nice and tight. Like so.
Next thing you're going to do, take the tag end of the floss, either tag end, and pass it through the ring on the back of the hook. I like to tie this under tension, so I place the end of the rig between my knees, and then all you're going to do is a succession of overhand knots, same knot you use to tie your shoelaces, several overhand knots, one on top of the other. Once you've done three or four of those, all you're going to do is trim off the tag ends. And I like to do it so that I've got a little pair of what I call bunny rabbit ears sticking up there. And the last job is going to be to melt those with a lighter. So I like a flame proof lighter set on low. Be careful you don't scorch your, your fingers, but even more importantly, don't scorch the, the rig or burn it because it will be ruined. Put the flame on that and just blob that floss down, press it with your finger, and those tag ends can never come undone. So your hook bait will never come off. And that is the finished rig. Absolutely perfect for presenting a boilie off the bottom, which has got two advantages really, two key advantages. One, the hook bait is away from any potential debris on the lake bed, but it is available, re readily available to a passing fish. But the great thing about a pop-up rig is that that hook is perfectly in position to nail into the bottom lip of the carp when it takes the bait. And that's one the, the key reason really why pop-ups are so effective they are just a great hooking mechanism everything is primed held up exactly where you want it ready to give you the perfect hook hold which you don't quite get with a bottom bait arrangement things have to move in a certain manner to get that hook into the part of the mouth you're trying to hook the fish in and that requires the rig to do the right thing and the fish to move at the same time not so with a pop-up rig it's all there as soon as the fish mouths that that hook point's going to go into the bottom lip and it's game on so that is the stiff multi-hinge, ready to go out into the lake. Not sure we're going to catch a fish on this session. Lake's not been fishing very well and we're only here for a few hours, but we're going to give it a good go. That is the multi-hinge, brilliant for quick changing your hooks. Very, very effective for fishing pop-up boilies in any situation. Often when I use this, I'll just feed with the catapult um, or the throwing stick. Or if I'm fishing it in a hole in the weed, then I'll use some, a spawn to bait the boilies nice and accurately over the top. Don't need a lot of bait. Most of the time I'll just cast this where I've seen fish and then use one of those methods just to place a few handfuls of bait over the top. Very often you'll see me using this maybe with just six or seven baits around it. As I've said in, in some of the other videos that we've done quite often on pressured lakes, less is more. And just a few baits and a hook bait in the right place is all you need. But for fishing that boilie, whether it's a single or for fishing with other baits around it, there aren't many better rigs to do that than the stiff multi-hinge. Okay, so the weather's changed radically in the last couple of hours, as you can see. The fish have all popped up on the surface, so after we've wound things up, I'm going to trot off and have a little go with a surface controller and see if I can nick a bite, but I don't think we're going to get one on the deck today. We're going to come back, we're going to do another session, we're going to do a part two for you guys which will focus more on the bottom bait side of rigs and presentation. Again, using these new JRC contact terminal items. All of which you've seen are available at your local JRC stockist, they're available now and uh, as you can see they're perfectly good for making fantastically effective carp rigs. Super sharp hooks and very very strong materials too. So give them a go. In the next part, as I said, we'll look at bottom bait rigs. In the meantime, thanks again for joining us on this beautiful late spring day. When we see you next, there'll probably be a bit of fauna and foliage out and it will start to look really like spring. So if you can get out there and enjoy it, it's a lovely time of year to be carp fishing because the mosquitoes aren't out yet. So it's my favorite time for that reason, um, but many others as well. The birds are singing their heads off and it's a joy to be alive. Get out, do some carp fishing, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.
Well, that is a really, really nice bonus end to a, a very, very short session of just a few hours. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed watching. We look forward to seeing you again next time. From both of us, thanks for watching. <laughs>